Kiorana, te rio te kuke airani, Kiorana ki te autai aki, ka toa toa no te moana nui aki wa. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a Kiwi, I'm a fifth generation New Zealander. I'm currently Professor of Archaeology at the University of Otago. But um, my, the place where I learnt to be an archaeologist and an anthropologist was at the University of Auckland where I was very, very privileged to be part of this wonderful community of scholars, Māori and Pacific scholars, ethnomusicologists, linguists, anthropologists, archaeologists who were immersed in the cultures and peoples of the Pacific. And that was where, and there's, I can see people in the audience here today who were with me there, and that was uh, a great privilege to me, and that's where I learned to be who I am today as a Pacific scholar. My own interests were in the deep history of Aotearoa and the connections between New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. Um, and I explored these connections as a PhD student. As a PhD student in archaeology, I moved to the Cook Islands and I did my PhD research there over a period of years. It was difficult for my supervisors to get me to come back to Auckland. I remember they actually went over to bring me home. And um, I, I worked on the very small island of Mauki, Akataka Manoa, and that's where I did my PhD research. <coughs> and Akataka Manoa was really my introduction to Hawaiiki. That's where I really learnt about Hawaiiki. And so it was a great pleasure for me to be, to be asked to come here today to talk about Hawaiiki because that is a connection for me in my past and it's an opportunity for me to revisit, revisit that time and that place. This is Mauki. When I was there, there was no airstrip. That's relatively new. We arrived on a 400 ton trading vessel. Um, so my first introduction to Hawaiki really was, was on a walker, a big walker, but a walker nonetheless. Um, so what is interesting and important about Hawaiki? Well, first of all, Hawaiki is important to us because of the very special place in which we live, in this Pacific world. Everything about us as Pacific peoples is about journeys. We live on islands. All our history begins with a journey, and the journey to New Zealand was an exceptionally unusual one. It's at least 3,000 kilometres to the Cook Islands. This is the Pacific world, and that's about the same distance as London to Cairo. So it's a huge, it's a huge distance and an extraordinary journey. And <clears throat> when we live on islands, we naturally think about homelands. In fact, Hawaiki is a concept that emerges naturally out of our very geography, our thinkings about the past. And this is reflected, of course, in the traditions and histories of all of the peoples of the Pacific. They all start in the homeland. They all start in Hawaiki. But the funny thing is, that's not the case with archaeology. When I was growing up as an archaeologist, archaeologists in New Zealand always thought about and talked about our past as if it started when the people got off the waka. It's not the same now, but in the past, archaeologists always talked about Hawaii. It wasn't, it was just the place where the canoes came from. But our history started when people got off the boat, they walked ashore, and then they started adapting to the new land. That wasn't me, that wasn't my interest. I was interested in what happened before that and what brought the people to New Zealand because, of course, migration histories don't start when you get off the plane or jump off the boat. I know migrants, new migrants in, in um, Dunedin, where I'm from, who are coming here from Syria. Their stories didn't start when they got off the aeroplane at Dunedin Airport. Their story started in Syria or, or in Turkey. where they. So this is really, really important to me, was to understand Hawaiki. Not just as a mythical homeland, but as a real place where real people lived and made decisions. So that was, that was um, where I come from as an archaeologist, and that's where I started. So what I want to do today is to talk about Hawaiki, 
what we know and think we know about Hawaiki based on the archaeology. And, and I will talk at various times about the way in which the traditions and the archaeology come together. So this is what I want to talk about. Where and when was Hawaiki? What was life and society like there? And another thing which I think is really fascinating um, is what happened in Hawaiki just after the canoes left for Aotearoa. This is something we actually know a little bit about. I will start by talking about where and when was Hawaiki and just briefly touch on that, uh, the when part of it. The archaeology nowadays looks pretty straightforward. There's not very many people here before about 1300 and then there's lots of people here. And, um, uh, and so we have people really across most of Aotearoa by a, just after 1300, but it's been very, very difficult for us to find archaeological evidence of people here before 1300. Of course, there must have been people here. There has to have been explorers and maybe even early settlers. But what we think we know right now is that around about 1300 or shortly thereafter, lots of people arrived in some sort of mass migration. And this, of course, is consistent with the oral traditions which talk about many waka arriving in New Zealand. And it's consistent too with the genetic evidence. And I am not an, uh, an expert in genetics, but my colleague Lisa, who will talk later, is. It looks very much like the concept of mass migration is supported by the genetic data. So very simply, I would say that if we're interested in Hawaiki, we're interested in the place about 1300 AD, 1200 to 1300, maybe 1400 AD. That's our Hawaiki time. And what about the place? Whereabouts is Hawaiki? Well, we can start with the Polynesian Triangle that we're all familiar with. This is an arbitrary um, geographic division to some extent, although it was one that was recognized by Cook. Within that triangle, all of the people speak very closely related languages, and that's why the languages that we call the Polynesian languages. So Hawaiki's got to be in that triangle. Let's narrow it down. Here's the language tree. And there you can see that our languages ooh, are over here in this, in this little branch. At, at, the, at the side, we've got the East Polynesian languages there. Here are the East Polynesian languages. So Hawaiki's got to be somewhere, logically, where those East Polynesian languages are spoken, and that's here. From the Marquesas, stretching down through French Polynesia over to the west, to the, to the Cook Islands. But we can go a little bit further than that. Here's the Tahitian languages, the Tahitic languages. And that's where our, our closest relations are linguistically. And those of you who have been up to the Cook Islands or into Tahiti, you know that you will be able to use te reo there and get some type of understanding going on. And of course, our great, my great ancestor, anthropological ancestor, Tarangi Hiroa, he was in Mangaia and he sat down with the Mangaian chiefs as Tupaya did here in New Zealand. And before too long, within a couple of weeks, Tarangi Hero was able to have conversations, very meaningful conversations with the peoples of Mangaia. He, he of course did that later in Hawaii, which is a little bit more tricky. Um, so there's where the Tahi this is where the Tahitian languages are spoken. In, in this little area here. But I think we can narrow down Hawaii a little bit more than that. I think that um, uh, blob that I've got on the screen there, it's not very clear, but it stretches to the Tuamotus. But I think we can discount the Tuamotus. First of all, they're a long, long way away. But secondly, they're very low islands. They're only a few metres above sea level. They have no stone. They have no, uh, most of them, no stone. They have no standing water sources, fresh water sources, and they have no forests. They have no forests that might provide the trees that we need to build the Great Walker. So I think what we can do is narrow that down even further and say we're looking at these high islands. 
the high islands of East Polynesia, the high islands of the societies, the Cook Islands, the Austral Islands, and this is really where Hawaiki lies for us. This group of islands here, where the languages are right, the islands are right, they're just the right distance. So this is Hawaiki, about 1200 to 1400 AD. This is, this is that key zone, that key time and that key place. And we have archaeological sites that are in that zone and date to that period. This is just a number of them from the Society Islands, Mopiti, Fa'ahia and Vaitootia, which are on the island of Huahine. And in the Cook Islands, we have an, uh, six or so sites there that are just in that right time scale. Ure'ia, excavated by my colleague from Auckland University, Melinda Allen, and Anayo, excavated by me on the island of Mooki, which is the second um, uh, image on the right. And what do we know then about these societies, these people who were living in these sites in Hawaii in the early 1300s, at about the time when the canoes left from there to come to Aotearoa? Well, the thing is about these sites is that they are very, very characteristic. They're very unique. They contain artefacts and, the, and represent a way of life that is very, very specific to that time and place. For example, the artefacts in these sites, and there's an examples there, these are art, Polynesian artefacts, East Polynesian artefacts that are not found anywhere else. They're not found in West Polynesia. For example, we don't find these type of fish hooks, these type of stone adzes, these toki. They're never found in Tonga, Nui, Samoa. They appear in these Hawaii phase sites, these sites dating to the 1300s right here in this Hawaii zone. We find the fish hooks, for example, and this is one of the, even today we recognise the, the, the matau as an as a iconic, characteristic Polynesian form. It's not, it's a Hawaii artefact tradition. You don't find these in Samoa or Tonga or Fiji. These, are, these, were, these came into being in Hawaii. The toki, the toki too, the, the stone adzes, and these are a little bit more complicated. For, for us as archaeologists, stone adzes tell these really uh, uh, clear stories. They, they, they're very, very characteristic. These, stone, these toki here may just look like stone tools to you, but to any archaeologist, these will only be found in Hawaii, and they will only be found in the 13 to 1400s. This one here actually is one from a site on the west coast of the South Island, from Westport, from Kawatiri but I could take that to Tahiti and I could drop it in a site dating to 1300s there and nobody would bat an eye. It is identical, absolutely identical. And the, the one on the top right there, that's um, the archaeologist here will recognise that as a, a, what we call a duff type 4A ads or a hogback ads or reverse triangular ads. Drop it into the Marquesas and it would just disappear. It would be identical. These are Hawaii ads forms and they're never found in West Polynesia. So Hawaii is not just a time and a place, it's a time and a place with a very distinctive cultural tradition. Here's an example here. This is from a, a book written in the 50s by one of our archaeological ancestors. And these show the typical Hawaii ad, uh, artifact forms. The, the tattooing chisels, the pendants, the ornaments, the fish hooks and the toki up the top. And those ones there are from Mopiti. They're from Mopiti, a little small site of Mopiti in the Society Islands in French Polynesia. The ones on the left are from Blenheim. They're identical. <coughs> so Hawaii is a real place, real people, and they're doing something very different and very unique within Polynesia, within East Polynesia. So let's look at what the way of life was like in Hawaii just before the canoes arrived, but before the canoes set off. In fact, even the lifestyle, the way of life of the people in Hawaii at that time is very different than it was when Cook arrived. Very different. 
in the Cook Islands, we know of about one, two, maybe six or seven sites that date to this period. They all contain those artefacts that I just showed you. They're all pretty much the same. But they have a lot of other things in common too. For a start, they're all big villages. Now, we, all, we often think of Polynesian villages and Polynesians living in villages, but in fact, when uh, people arrived, when the Europeans arrived in Polynesia, people lived in much more disper dispersed settlement patterns, particularly around the gardens, around the marae. But in the 1300s, people were living in very um, uh, dense, nucleated villages. And they were living right on the reef passages. And those of you who are sailors will notice that these settlements are all on the leeward coasts of the islands. They're on the most sheltered parts of the islands and they're on the big reef passages. And they're there for a reason. And the reason is that these people were very heavily engaged in voyaging. Much more so than they were later. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now let's go back to Maoki, to Akatoka Manoa, and we'll, I want to talk briefly about the site I worked on, which is the site of Anayo, Mirror Cave, um, dating to about 1350 AD, so it's right in that Hawaii time period and place. One of the things that struck me when I was excavating the site as a, as a, as a student, I was a master's student first, but they couldn't get me to come back, so they upgraded me to a PhD and let me continue there. So when I was excavating there, the thing that I was really struck with was the artefacts. The toki, the stone adzers, and these beautiful pearl shell fish hooks, matau, that we were finding in the site. And they were interesting because there is no stone on Mauki, there is no pearl shell in the waters of the southern Cook Islands. So where was this coming from? And this, of course, signaled to me this, the importance of voyaging, of networking, of um, the canoe traditions in this early Hawaii time phase. As we moved further out, this was the first uh, site of this time period that was excavated in the Cook Islands, but as we, more sites were, were looked at that date to this 14th century time period, we found again evidence of importation, of networks, of movements. And this is something that Alex talked about in New Zealand as well in the same time period. Remember Alex talked yesterday about the importance of, of movement, of exchange, of voyaging. And we see this in the Cook Islands, these early sites, they're full of pearl shell that's coming in from a thousand kilometers to the north. We're getting volcanic stone, toki, coming in from Raiatea and from the French Polynesia to the east. We're getting even little bits of pottery filtering in from Tonga and from Fiji and volcanic stone from Samoa. So Hawaiki is not, these are not small isolated islands. These are islands that are part of these voyaging networks. And this is what we know today. We can see as we, you know, we're 25 years later, we're getting a really good picture of the, of the voyaging networks that, that straddled Hawaiki in that wider zone of Hawaiki in the 13 to 1400s. And this is a, a diagram from a recent paper that we published last year that shows the connections to, to this Hawaiki zone. This is Hawaiki here and all of these connections to Marquesas, to Samoa, to Tonga, to elsewhere, which of course we see also in the oral traditions. And um, we talked about these too. So what we see in Hawaii, I think, is something like this. Each archipelago in the 13 to 1400s had a network, a, a sphere of influence around it, voyaging and, and the coming and going of people, of things, of artifacts, and of course, of genes. And, but these were sort of overlapping spheres of influence. So really, you had these networks of movement that went right through this Hawaii zone at this particular time. So to summarize this, I would say, if people say, where is Hawaii? I will say it is a zone encompassing 25 or more islands in the Southern Cook Islands. Eastern French Polynesia. It's not a single island, it's a, a, a time and a place where there is dynamic movements of people to and fro between these networked islands. 
a very unique time and place. And this is reflected too in the genetics here in New Zealand at Wairau Bar, where we were working with um, Rangitane or Wairau with the repatriation of their peoples who had been taken from the ground there in the 1940s. The genetics showed from those people, and Lisa can perhaps talk about this, that the people buried there were first generation New Zealanders, but they were not closely related to each other. They probably came from different villages, if not different islands. So Hawaiki was not a single island, a single village, a single canoe. It was people coming out of this networked area of interaction. Now I want to finish by talking about something I'm really interested in, and that is what happened next. Okay, Hawaiki, it's our mythical homeland, but people stayed there, they continued living there. It continued to be a home for Polynesian people. What happened next? After the canoes left for Aotearoa, all sorts of exciting things happened in Hawaiki. Around about 1400 or thereabouts, this major religious movement swept through Hawaiki. And that's the Marae tradition, which didn't, in its full religious sense, come to New Zealand. And this is, this is a, a, a Marae in, in, in the Papua Nuo Valley. It's almost certainly the Marae that Dame Jenny Shipley visited, that she talked about. And this, and this Marae tradition goes right through East Polynesia, and, and right through Hawaii, doesn't go to Samoa, Tonga, and interestingly, it never really got to New Zealand. So the canoes must have come here before this religious tradition fully um, crystallised in the form of these stone monumental structures. It got up to Hawaii, where we, where we have the heiau, and of course it got to Rapa Nui, which look extraordinary and different, but to archaeologists, it's an East Polynesian marae, it's the same. And these marae sites in various forms are everywhere in Hawaii, every single island. The other, great, the other thing that happened in Hawaii just after the canoes left is that the whole voyaging tradition changed. In, at the period where I'm talking about, islands were linked by continuous voyaging traditions, but after about 1400 AD, those networks changed and declined. After 1400 AD, the archaeological sites no longer contain stone and pottery and pearl shell from other places. The voyaging networks that continued were not about trade and exchange and economic activity. They changed, they, they contracted to some extent, and so we get the abandonment of islands. These little red islands are islands that we call the mystery islands. They were inhabited in the 1300s and linked to the wider world through these voyaging networks. After 1400 AD, they were all abandoned. And they're abandoned today, the ones in, in the Hawaiian chain, for example. These enigmatic islands, nobody living on them, but dozens and dozens of marae abandoned there. So the voyaging network started to contract. The voyaging continued, of course, within archipelagos, and later on it became fused with these religious and ritual traditions that Dame Anne talked about, the Karaoi traditions in, in um, Tahiti and probably in the Cook Islands as well. These Karaoi traditions were not about trade and exchange and moving goods around. They were about ritual and tradition and all sorts of um, quite raunchy things that Dame Anne didn't talk about. <laughs> um, so Hawaii, Hawaii continued. It's a real place inhabited by real people. It's a unique time and place. This period, 13 to 1400s in Hawaii, was a time and a place that has never, didn't exist before and faded away after the 1400s, a place of cultural wealth and growth. Uh, the, the, the sites themselves speak of very, very um, wealthy, confident people. The type of people who would get in Waka and set out with their families, hundreds and hundreds of people head to the south and create new worlds here in the south. Okay, so that's my interest in Hawaii. I, I just want to make one other connection, if I could, and, it's, and just to reiterate these points about connections and joining and voyaging and talking about it from a personal perspective. When I was a PhD student in Maoki, 
my firstborn, my daughter was born there in Mauki on, in the archaeological context. And of course, her whakapapa is to Mauki as well. And she was born there. Now today, she's a PhD student, she's a historian. And she's gone back to the Cook Islands to do her PhD, looking not at connections again. Her passion is the time when the first Cook Island people were engaging with Europeans. She's interested in, in that phase. But I really like this. And of course, she's, unlike me, she's got the added dimension of akapapa anga, of whakapapa, of connections. So, and I like that idea of us, of us, all of us, going back, reconnecting. And I think that's a really good model for scholarship, you know, that we, we, we go back, we talk, we interconnect, and we carry on. Okay, thank you very much. We have probably one time, one question, time for one question, and then we have to move on with our program. I have the privilege of working for the Te Aumario Trust. We had our very first meeting here before Tuya 250 was recognised by government at the instigation of Anne Salmon. <laughs> And our first meeting was in this room on the 6th of February, on the day that we opened this museum. So I didn't know I'd be standing here today. I didn't expect to even this morning. I acknowledge Jeff Evans. Where are you, Jeff? We started working with him and the Kaikoriro of the North here, who have been so gracious to us in giving their stories of the first voyages. Those recordings are made, we have many more to come, and we are growing this incredible archive. Out of it, inevitably, we are talking with people like Heck Busby, Moi Maida, Stanley Conrad, James Eruera, and many more. But in that corridor is coming out what you're talking about, from their real experiences, not just on their marae on the home front. Where I was here when Hukuleya arrived, and Sir James said, I am going to be laughing today, tomorrow, and forever. You are doing what these people did. And that was the beginning of the voyage in recovery. So when you're talking about recovery and reconnecting, that is what these people are already doing. And it's because they're not in the room, I had to get up and talk about it. <laughs> But they're doing it, and the stories that are coming out that I've and Jeff have been privileged to, be here, to hear are going to give you even more than you've given us today. And you've given me a huge amount to add to that. So what this hui is about, Tenakwe Matu, Matu, Te Arakite Trust, Patukeha Nati Kuta, Heritage New Zealand Dock. What you've been doing is really leading the charge. Today is the discussion beginning only, but what should have been happening a long time ago? Kia ora Gerard, for your meeting and your, what you said yesterday, because out of that we are going to really understand who we all are, Māori Papia, the dual heritage, the shared future that is the kaupapa of Tuyutu Kiti. So perhaps I'm telling you something you already know. <laughs> have, you, have you talked with Stanley? It's extraordinary, isn't it, what he's experienced? Mm -hmm.